Hi, everyone. My name is Sydney Yeager, and I'm the Public Programs Coordinator at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. Uh, now in its 24th year, the museum is committed to the crucial mission of educating our diverse community about Jewish life and heritage before, during, and after the Holocaust. As part of that mission, our programs are meant to illuminate the stories of survivors, broader histories of hate and anti-Semitism through time, and stories of resistance against injustice. Today, we remember Sophie Scholl, Hans Scholl, and Christoph Probst, who were all part of the White Rose Resistance Group. They took a stand against the Nazis, and 79 years ago, on February 22nd, they were executed by the Gestapo. We remember their brave actions. As Sophie Scholl said, stand up for what you believe in, even if you are standing alone. We're honored to be joined by today's moderator, excuse me, Lori Weintraub, along with our speakers Wolfgang Huber, Frank McDonough, and Nathan Stoltzfus. Wolfgang is the son of Professor Kurt Huber, a professor of philosophy at the University of Munich who guided the members of the White Rose and was executed on July 13th, 1943 for his part in the group. Wolfgang is Professor Emeritus at the Catholic University of Eichstadt Ingolstadt and has spoken widely about his father and the White Rose. Frank McDonough is a historian and author who has written numerous books about the Third Reich. These include the Gestapo, the myth and reality of Hitler's secret police, Hitler and the rise of the Nazi party, and, so and Sophie Scholl, the woman who defied Hitler. His most recent book is The Hitler Years, a two-volume narrative history of the years when Hitler ruled Germany. Nathan Stoltzfus is the Dorothy and Jonathan Rintels Professor of Holocaust Studies at Florida State University. His most recent books include The Power of Populism and People, Resistance and Protest in the Modern World, Women Defying Hitler, Rescue and Resistance Under the Nazis, and Hitler's Compromises, Coercion and Consensus in Nazi Germany. Lori Weintraub, our moderator, is Professor of History and Founding Director of the Wagner College Holocaust Center on Staten Island. She is currently editing Eyewitness to History, Documents of the Holocaust, and completing a project on women resistance leaders in the Holocaust. She is co-author of the original play Rise Up, Young Holocaust Heroes, and co-curator of the exhibit Rescue and Resistance, among others, at the Wagner College Holocaust Center. Thank you all so much for joining us, and I'm now going to pass things over to Lori. It's an honor to be here today with two scholars um, of the German resistance movement, uh, and also with the son of, um, of Kurt Huber, professor of philosophy and musicology, and one of Sophie Scholl's professors. Uh, this is a unique group, the White Rose. Among the few voices against Nazism within Germany, the Young White Rose members, a student resistance movement based in Munich, had the courage to place conscience before conformity. Beginning in the summer of 1942, the leaders of this network wrote four leaflets and later two others, as well as conducting graffiti campaigns. You just heard about how just today on the anniversary, February 22nd, 79 years ago, Sophie Scholl at the age of 21, was executed along with her brother Hans and Christoph Probst. And six months later in July and October, other White Rose members, Alexander Schmorell, Willie Graf, and Professor Kurt Uber were also executed. And then members from the, a member from the Hamburg White Rose, Hans Liebelt was executed in January of 1945. Their carefully crafted words and actions continue to inspire hope in activists around the world. In 2003, young viewers of the German television station ZDF chose the siblings Hans and Sophie Scholl as the most important German individuals of all time above the composer Johannes Sebastian Bach, the poet Goethe and the scientist Albert Einstein. My own research over the past few years has been to integrate eyewitness testimony of resistance and rescue and to seek to establish a canon of names of resistors and to ask why can we name the perpetrators but not the resistors. Our distinguished panel today will help us to better identify these resistors. And I wanna start by asking um, Professor Wolfgang Uber, um, just what it means to you um, to be having this event on February 22nd. Is this a day that should be better known both inside and outside of Germany? Do you have any direct memories of this time? And 
to what extent do you take pride in knowing that the leaflet that your father um, authored was distributed by the thousands by allied troops um, during their campaign against the Nazis? Well, these are <clears throat> many questions. Um, the one is, for instance, my personal rem remembrance. So I could say, I don't remember very well my father. I was only four years old at that time when he died. So my uh, memory is not worth telling. There are not very important things I could tell you about. Maybe the funeral I could remember, and the funeral was, um, the cemetery was already closed and everything had to be in great hurry. So I had to run instead of to walk and uh, everything was about strange to me because my mother told me my father is in the hospital and uh, all of a sudden he wasn't in the hospital any longer. So this was a strange day to remember, but it's the only thing I really could remember. <clears throat> the other thing is, um, Hans and Sophie Scholl have a high degree of prominence, but I think a high degree of prominence doesn't necessarily imply a high interest in the resistant movement. I think Germans know very well about Hans and Sophie Scholl as prominent figures. But I think they are not so much interested in really what they do, what they did. And I think the interest in the resistance is not the same as the prominence. Um, there was another question, please. What was it? Um, what, what does this day mean to you? Um, and whether you think yes. it should be a better known day, both inside and outside of Germany? Well, it's well known abroad, I think. The White Rose is pretty known abroad. So I think it's not necessary to improve there. But um, there are great differences in some countries. I mean, a country like China uh, might well do in learning a bit about the White Rose, but I'm quite sure they will forbid it before they learn about it. This is one thing. And... Uh, the other thing is about my family. Well, the second, uh, the twenty second of February, of course, always was a was a moment to remember. But in our family, the more important time was about the thirteenth of July, the death of my father. This was a time where we went to the grave and and similar things. I'm, I'm, I'm so, it's very touching to hear you talk about your father and I, I can't, I want to hear more um, about what he means to you and what you hope that he will mean to all the listeners today. Uh, I'm going to turn for a minute just to, to one of the other, uh, Professor Nathan Stoltzfus. Um, you've been involved in teaching and research about dissent in Nazi Germany and have a particular interest in how the White Rose sought to shape opinion as the German conscience. Can you help us to better understand, um, as Professor Uber was saying, so we don't just know the name, but understand what is behind the resistance? How did they use the written word to inspire resistance, um, including quoting authors like Goethe and Schiller? Um, what is it that you think that youth today and, and all of us should know about the White Rose. Well, thank you. That, that's, again, more good questions. <clears throat> uh, as uh, we learned, they were a handful of students. <clears throat> I think what's important, or one of the important things, is that they could have done nothing, uh, and that uh, we need to also uh, uh, lift up the goodness that happened uh, out of these uh, dark times, and that they represent <laughs> that. Uh, now, uh, I'm interested, like you said, in how uh, they found the courage to speak out. And uh, I think the value of their idea and work is indicated uh, certainly by that poll you mentioned. But uh, I wanted to mention that Hans apparently uh, heard about and read uh, Bishop Catholic Bishop von Galen's sermons against euthanasia and, and the results. 
and uh, was impressed with the importance of possibilities of opinion. But with government in control of media and police, he didn't have a pulpit like uh, von Gallen did, what could you do? Uh, having learned in the summer of 42 about uh, mass murder in the Eastern Front, Poland and USSR, uh, Hans Scholl and Alexander Schmorell uh, felt compelled to take action. And uh, when Sophie, Hans, uh, Sophie Scholl, Hans Scholl's uh, sister, found out about this some months later, she, uh, she joined. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, so uh, they had this notion that uh, if they were, as they said, we are your conscience, someone had to speak out and uh, that would open up the possibilities for people who were silenced uh, because they were in a minority or didn't have anyone who felt like they did in dissent. And social psychologists have some models for this. One is uh, pluralistic ignorance where you don't speak out if no one else uh, seems to be on your side, but uh, they hope to get a, a movement uh, and uh, of, uh, of uh, awareness. I think uh, what is uh, interesting there is that, of course, they were imitating Hitler's own uh, idea about uh, taking control through, um, through opinion, through uh, basically the first pillar of, of mass support. And uh, getting back to, I know that some have considered their resistance reckless or even pathetic, but I think uh, the, the, the Allies dropped uh, their last uh, pamphlet over Germany, Southern Germany, indicating uh, <clears throat> the importance of, of opinion and uh, if you've seen that last part of the film Downfall with Hitler's secretary, Junge, she talks about how she had given herself for all her life a pass on taking action. But when she came across the memorial of pamphlets on the, uh, on the street, she realized that she had the same birth year as Sophie Scholl. And it hit her you know, mightily and uh, and she's been and she she realized that uh, there were people uh, who had spoken out even though they were young. So their importance continues obviously into the presence. Okay. Well, thank you for getting us started by thinking about their motives and including the growing awareness that the Nazis were, um, you know, killing the mentally and physically disabled, as well as the atrocities on the Eastern Front. Um, and Frank, can you tell us more about the strategies of the White Rose? Why did they take such great risks? Um, and you know, how, where do you weigh in on the opinion about um, you know, the, the risk they took, particularly in distributing the, the sixth pamphlet? I think at the start, the White Rose was really uh, only uh, Hans Schall and Alexander Schmorell, they, was, they were medical students at Munich University, and they wanted to mount some kind of resistance movement. Um, and th they decided that the best way to do this would be to um, post leaflets. Now, it's not a very, you know, it's, it, you'd say, well, who, who are you going to post the leaflets to? They decided to post the leaflets to people they found in the local telephone book. And they picked out, in the telephone book, it had the name of a person, but also had the occupation. So interestingly enough, they chose more middle-class occupations to send the leaflets to. So in a sense, I mean, I think um, they met a, a communist resistor uh, called Harnack, and he said to them, well, the, the people you're sending these leaflets to uh, won't be receptive to them. They are more likely to be, the people who are in these positions of authority are more likely to be committed Nazis. And so their aims were to, if they could, disseminate the leaflets. And in the leaflets, they said, copy the leaflet and distribute it. So the idea was you'd get a leaflet and then you distribute it to the other people that you knew. Now, interestingly enough, the Gestapo collected up about 
90% of the leaflets that were sent. In other words, they were sent to Germans who were patriotic and gave the leaflets in. So in terms mm. of actually getting through to the general public, the White Rose wasn't successful in that way. Their aims were non-violent. Sophie joined the group uh, when she came to Munich University in 1942. And um, as Nathan just said, she didn't know at the beginning who, who was distributing these leaflets. And then she read one leaflet and I think her hands was at a typewriter and she read it, some of it out to him, some of the quotations in it who were philosophers who he liked. And she said, is this you? Because she was convinced it was him. And then after a while he said no. And then he said, yeah. They also brought into their circle a guy called Willie Graff. He was another medical student, although he didn't participate in any of the, the leaflets. In actual fact, his story is quite amazing because he was a committed Catholic um, and he was very brave. Interestingly enough, the Gestapo thought that he was the leader of the White Rose. The reason was because he, he, they found that he was visiting places in the Rhineland and they thought he was the leader, which he wasn't. But he did stand by uh, the White Rose and they kept him on death row for a long, long time. Um, so they were medical students. It's interesting, isn't it, that, you know, uh, Willie Graff, Alexander Schmorell and um, Hans were all medical students. So instead of killing people in the war, and they were in the German army as well, they were healing people, which I think is quite interesting. Sophie herself had been anti-Nazi um, from about 1937 onwards. Remember, Hans and Sophie were in the Hitler Youth. They were actually Hitler Youth leaders. And Hans, if you see a photograph of him, you know, he does look every inch, the, you know, the Aryan Superman. And he was made the leader of the local Hitler Youth. But then um, he turned on the Nazis because uh, he, got, he was involved in a, in a case that was brought by, by a member of the Hitler Youth, a, a, a sexual case, a homosexual case. And uh, after that, Sophie and Hans turned on um, on the Nazi regime. And during the war, even at the start of the war, when Hitler's winning, they are still very much against it. Then Kurt Huber, he's their lecturer at Munich University, and he was a, a brilliant lecturer by all accounts. The, the, the actual lecturers, you know, his, his son will, will tell you, the lecturers were packed, and he was one of those lecturers um, who was very witty, you know, punctuated all of his lectures with a funny anecdote. Um, and Sophie really liked Kurt Huber. And Kurt Huber became very friendly with Sophie. And through Sophie, they sort of brought him in to the White Rose group. I think the reason why, because the first four leaflets didn't really reach a wide audience. So they brought in Kurt because of his academic ability. He was internationally, he was an internationally famous academic of um, folk music. So they brought him into the group and then he started to participate in the last two leaflets. Can you say, there's two things I wanted to bring out. One is about um, Hans and Sophie's father and to what extent his anti-Nazism influenced the birth of the White Rose. And then the second question is if you could just, um, if you or Professor Uber could explain a little bit the nuances um, between the opinions of Hans and uh, Alex and then um, Professor Uber. I think that uh, Sophie was a committed Christian. I think they were all interested in philosophy, a humanist philosophy. I think you'd have to say, um, I know people have said, well, were they liberals? I think that they were mostly at the top committed Christians. They were very committed Christians. And the, what they hated was the Hitler regime was persecuting uh, Christians, priests, clerics, and so on. And so that drove them towards it. As for the nuances, I'd say, you know, the, uh, probably, probably Hans was more of a kind of liberal, constitutionalist, Democrat. Uh, I think Alexander Schmorell, he was uh, very pro-Russian because his mother was Russian. Um, so uh, he actually was sort of in, fa in favor of the Red Army in the Second World War. I'd say he was, he was a little bit more to the left of the group. And he actually wrote one of the leaflets, which uh, goes on about sabotage. 
uh, you know, sabotage factories, sabotage uh, newspapers. And in the actual interrogation, this was a big thing to say that they committed high treason. So between Hans and Alexander, there was a bit of a tension there between should they be putting forward a peace message or should they be putting forward a more sort of strident anti-militarist point of view? Kurt Hoover, again, I'd say he was sort of, I could say, a kind of old-fashioned, I'd say, conservative stroke liberal, if you like. So, um, and um, he, he, he hated the whole idea of totalitarianism. And he came to hate Hitler um, the more that he started to lose the battles of the war. And interestingly enough, he had, he had a vision of, you know, the Hitler had to be stopped. And I think it's Stalingrad. He writes the, the, the leaflet, the sixth leaflet. He writes the sixth leaflet. And there's a bit of a dispute between him and uh, Hans and Alex over that sixth leaflet. Because it, I think in the original leaflet, he says something about our glorious Wehrmacht. And Hans and Alex say, no, there's nothing glorious about the Wehrmacht. Take that, take that phrase out of the leaflet. And he says, no, I want that phrase in. Now, he actually falls out with the, gr with the group over that issue. And he doesn't know. This is where you could say um, they are a bit reckless. Because instead of sort of saying, OK, shelve the six leaflet, they deliver it. Hans and Sophie deliver it on the university campus. In other words, he said, I don't agree with the leaflet, and they've just dismissed his point of view. And so that is kind of one of the issues in, in, in the White Rose. And amazingly, you know, Pierre Hoover, what a brave man. He never actually brought up this issue all the way through his trial, and he died, you know, a committed man like a Thomas More, if you like, a man for all seasons, even though he knew that they fell out with this leaflet. He stuck by his guns and he stuck by what the White Rose stood for. And that's why he's an incredibly brave man, what he did. Some people might have tried to, to escape punishment by saying, well, I didn't write that leaflet. It's nothing to do with me. But no, he didn't. He, he took the rap for what happened. And that's why he's an incredibly brave man. Thank you. Yes, that, that um, it really clarifies um, the legacy of Kurt Huber in, in a touching way. Um, Nathan, can you revisit that? Do you want to add anything to that? To what extent do you think Hans and Sophie were impacted by their father's um, politics? And then um, how, how um, Professor Huber's uh, politics then further affected them or differences with, with, within the White Rose? Yeah, uh, just picking up on what uh, what Frank said that they were uh, <clears throat> they were reckless, which is what uh, many have have sort of leveled at them. I prefer to think of them as idealistic, and especially uh, you know uh, <clears throat> this the same. I feel like it's an uneven maybe uh, contrast between them and say, for example, the twentieth of July conspiracy, which also probably couldn't have brought fascism to an end by killing Hitler. So I, I like to stick up for them as, uh, as idealist rather than, than reckless, although you certainly have those aspects. Certainly, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, it would have been totally unrealistic for the White Rose to try to kill, to take power or to overthrow the regime by force just as it was to try to change that whole propaganda machine uh, that uh, Hitler had built up and uh, all the belief in him through changing opinion. Uh, but uh, they did hope that that uh, demise of the uh, German army in the uh, East Front at Stalingrad would be a wind in their sails, that people would certainly have uh, been tiring uh, and maybe see the light. They expected, of course, unrealistically that the war would end sooner than it did. Uh, but, uh, you know, so there was some realism there in, uh, in their efforts to place, uh, to increase their demands and their maybe reckless distribution of, of pamphlets uh, after the fall of Stalingrad. 
Okay, and and Professor Uber, do you want to add anything about the you know what what you understand about the nuances between the different authors of the pamphlets? Pardon, if I, <clears throat> I just wanted to say that what does the white rose mean for us today? I think this is a very important question because we don't tell the story about the white rose because it's such a nice story. I think we tell it because we want to make sure that never again should happen a national socialism in that way it came. But we don't forget, I think, or we must not forget that Hitler came to power quite legally. And in every democracy, democracy is not so easy. I mean, you can't take democracy for granted. You always have to be alert that it could happen something with it. And at the moment, I think, we see a lot of things, especially in Germany, that make us alert and make us think about that um, I think, first of all, we have some obligation to remember the uh, white rose because of the courage they showed and because of the idea that maybe if a situation is similar in the future, there are also people who might have the same courage. But this is only a hope and uh, I think the moral obligation to remember and to have some sort of memorial is very important. Also, we have a party that say the Holocaust Memorial in the middle of Berlin is a shame. No, it is not a shame. It is necessary. It is necessary to remind these things in order to be sure that they won't come again. But they could come again in many disguises. So. There are many um, governments that have laws that look quite, quite simple or even helpful. So, for instance, if you say the press must be very balanced. So if you speak bad about one party, you speak also a bit good about one party. But now think all of them are corrupt. How to say good things about them? It's impossible. And there are laws about the press that are really restricting the press. And I think this is very, very difficult and very, very dangerous. At the moment in Germany, I see, so for instance, manifestations against the COVID measures of the government. So a journalist will come and provide some footage on the manifestation and he is insulted, he is threatened, he is even attacked. And I think there is missing a good deal of democratic behavior. Uh, democracy is not simply if you have elections. Elections alone, even if say free and perfect, is no guarantee that the whole, the whole state is democratic or that the people think democratically. But this is important and this is very necessary that we do so and that we remind of people who could think so. This, this reminds me very much of um, a quote from one of the last surviving members of the White Rose, Franz Miller. He said that Hans and Sophie did not want to be known as heroes, but in his view, they represented a struggle for truth and freedom. And I think that's a little bit what you're trying to, to get at. And I'm just gonna pull up some of the wording from um, the brochure, from the pamphlets. Um, so we can see a little bit how that they critiqued you know, the fascist government and their appeal. Um, and then we can go back to further conversation about their legacy today. Teach them to weave, um, tend crops, herd cattle. Um, so if you can, I, I don't know if everybody can sh see my screen, um, which already went too quickly, um, but here we have the, the members of the White Rose that we've been discussing, um, Professor Uber, Alexander Schmorell, Sophie and Hans, Christoph, and Willy Graf, um, and each of them who were executed by the regime. Um, and th this is to give you a little bit of a sense of the language of, of the White Rose. Um, 
In the second leaflet, they wrote, since the conquest of Poland, 300,000 Jews have been murdered in this country in the most bestial way. The German people slumber on in dull, stupid sleep and encourage the fascist, fascist criminal. Um, each one wants to be exonerated of guilt. Each one continues on his way with the most placid, calm conscience, people, but he cannot be exonerated. He is guilty. Uh, so this would be one of the efforts to- um, If they even believe what they said. to discourage the apathy. And then this, this, is this, this is the quote that reminded me of what you were just saying um, from the third leaflet. Our current state is the dictatorship of evil. We know that already, I hear you object, and we don't need you to reproach us for it yet again. But I ask you, if you know that, then why don't you act? Why do you tolerate these rulers gradually robbing you in public and in private of one right after another? Until one day, nothing, absolutely nothing remains but the machinery of the state under the command of criminals and drunkards. Um, so is th that's a little bit what you were referring to in terms of the, the passion they had um, in fighting the regime. I, I wonder if anybody wants to comment on either of those two um, quotes from the leaflets or anything else specifically about um, you know, the, the, the way they wrote the leaflets the style or the contents. Is there anything you want to add to that or to comment specifically on those two, two quotes? May I comment on the point whether they wanted to be heroes? I think this is the wrong question. The question is, do we want now to be the heroes? And if so, I think they are. And personally, I think they were heroes, but there is a tendency now in the present that uh, we want to say these were no heroes, they were quite ordinary people. And we published as many bad things about them as we could just to show that they were too normal. But I think this is not quite the true question. The question is, do we want them to be heroes? And I think they are, and I want them to be so. Also, I know there are many people who are against it. So I, I can yeah. just tell you that I, I also agree that I think that there is a place um, it, when Yad Vashem created Holocaust Remembrance Day in 1951, it was called um, Holocaust Martyrs and Heroes Day. And it's, it continues to be called that Yom HaShoah V'Hagavura. And I, I think that there is a place for um, heroism in the fight for human rights um, and to preserve democracy, as, as you were saying. Um, so in that scene, um, that shows us how Sophie is, is arguing for her position. Um, what do you think of this, this, the film centering the story on Sophie Scholl? How, how do you think that happened that, um, you know, there went from sort of a focus on the authors of the pamphlets to having more of a focus on Sophie Scholl. Well, it's such an excellent question. I've always wondered, and I'm sure Frank uh, might know more, but I think a critical moment was when the decision was made to uh, honor the White Rose at Valhalla near Regensburg. And uh, there was a decision to have Sophie Scholl represent uh, represent the Germans, uh, I mean, the White Rose there. And then of course these films, uh, the one that you showed uh, is also named uh, Sophie. I, uh, I, I really wonder what it means uh, given that Hans, of course, uh, the sibling brother uh, launched the movement and whether it indicates uh, uh, something more uh, emotional than than uh, and maybe uh, reckless. I, I don't I don't know. I wonder what others think. Certainly, I think uh, what is impressive about the clip you showed that is that he she is able to make her own conscience and to uh, follow that separately from the the conscience of of the uh, people all around her because certainly uh, you know conformity was a massive pressure that Hitler used to build his his movement and to keep people in line with national socialism, but she found her conscience aside from that, uh, from those masses. 
I think I think the reason why they they foregrounded Sophie was that number one, she was a woman, and you know that you know the, you, you haven't got millions of women in history who get highlighted. So I think that was one of the reasons. Number two was that. Sophie had become a kind of icon in Germany. I mean, I think there were about 143 schools named after her. And also, I think Hans was a more controversial figure. His life was more controversial than Sophie. And Sophie represented, I think, a kind of legacy for democracy. So she came to kind of represent, I think. I think in Germany, she represented the White Rose much more than... Um, Alexander Schmorell and Hans Scholl and um, even you know, Kurt Huber and uh, Willie Graf. Now, that's just the way things are, aren't they? Sometimes in history, we take somebody out and we make them into the hero when in actual fact, we know that there were, there were a group of them. There were a group of people here who should have all been venerated heroes. Now, I actually spoke to the director and he said that it would have been more difficult to sell the film around the world had it been called The White Rose. With Sophie Sholley said, it was, it, was easier, it was an easier sell to sell that as, as a film. So that's, again, commercial considerations as well. Since the film's come out, I mean, when I wrote my book, which is a long time ago, nobody in Britain knew who Sophie Scholl was. So I was starting from like a, a blank piece of paper. And then the film came out. And I went to the um, launch of the film and it was an art, it was basically an art house film. It didn't get a general release in all the big cinemas. It was mainly in art house cinemas that it was seen. And people, people who see it, they oh, have you seen the Sophie Shaw film? I think that the film itself, my problem with the film is that it starts with the, with the arrest of uh, Hans and Sophie and goes through the last four days. So we don't actually see the... Sophie comes across, and we see it in that clip as well, she comes across as really intense. Um, you know, she doesn't seem to be, you know, a laid back figure. She doesn't seem to have a sense of humour. And I think that that's the opposite of what you find when you go back and look at her life. When you look at her life and see all the photographs, she's nothing like the person you see in that film. You know, she's, she's funny, she's witty. They're all funny, they're all witty. They're all sorts of outgoing people. And we don't see that in the film. We see a kind of, she's almost like a kind of, you know, a kind of a, a committed sort of a committed sort of politician or something like that. And she was nothing like that. She was nothing like that. So the film doesn't really bring out her personality. And I think that that's where the film, people say, oh, it's a great film. It's a great film. Well, I think a great film is where you build up the characters of people and you know who they are. You know, Christoph Props walks down a corridor. We don't even know who he is <laughs> because we've not seen his life. We've not seen his relationship with Sophie. We don't, I don't know, but I don't think we even see Alexander Schmorell. We see him before in the first preamble. We see them falling out over the leaflet and that's about it. So I think the film doesn't, doesn't represent enough the sort of... Um, the all-round, intellectual, interesting, charming group that they were, people were attracted to them for that reason, because you know they, people would see them and be attracted to them. But if you see the film, you think, oh, she's a bit intense. And that is not what she was like at all, I think. And so I think the film, because it just, if you sort of go to the last four days of someone's life, and in that last four days, they've been arrested and put on trial for high treason. I don't think you see the whole person. And I think we need to look back at the leaflets as well, bring out what happened to the leaflets and look back at Sophie's life. And as you said earlier, her father, you know, her father was an important figure. You know, he was a liberal, he'd be the local mayor. The mother was a nurse. So she had that kind of background, if you like. Her mother gave her the kind of kindness. The father gave her the liberalism and the, 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 the sort of the, the principled stand. My view on, on the White Rose is that, you know, it, it's it's the legacy that they give. It's like Martin Luther King, you know, you say, well, well, what did Martin Luther King actually achieve? He never became a kind of politician. He was never a senator. He was never a congressman. He was never a president. But in a way, you listen to his speech and you see what he achieved. He achieved in capturing people's hearts and minds. And that is what the White Rose do. 
That is what Sophie Scholl does. She captures our heart. She is the person, and the White Rose as well, she is the person we'd like to be if we lived in Nazi Germany, but we know we couldn't have been that person because we wouldn't have had that kind of courage. We probably would have been the kind of person like Robert Moore, the, the, uh, the, the, the policeman, who actually admits that he was taken in by the regime and too many people in Nazi Germany look the other way. And uh, these were people who didn't want to look the other way. They didn't have to fight against Nazi Germany. They were middle class. They had good careers ahead of them. They were at university. And I think that that speaks volumes for them, I think. And they were willing, if you like, to put their life on the line. And, you know, in the end, what is courage? Courage is actually putting your life on the line for an idea or a belief. Uh, or even in, in war, you know, where you're a soldier, you know, you know, we all like to have that kind of courage. Very few people have that kind of courage. And that's why, in a way, we can identify with it in an admiration. This is the problem with, with icons like this. We can admire them. But when it comes to actually thinking, would I have done that? That's where we sort of part company, isn't it? Because we sort of think, oh, yes, I would have been a hero. But we all know that in many times in our lives, we've not been heroes. And, and I think that beautifully answers one of the questions um, that Lawrence Hellman had asked about, um, uh, oh no, yeah, somebody had asked, did it actually make, did their selfishness actually make a positive difference? And I think that you just answered that about how, how they resonated both in their time and since. Um, and I think another thing that's missing from the film is the way in which the other university students reacted to the execution. Um, we might assume that, that there was shock and horror, but that, that the, the other students at the University of Munich applauded the decision to execute them is, is sort of shocking. And um, uh, there's a quote from the German, from the, one of the former German president, Joachim Gauck, who says that Sophie Scholl and the White Rose quote, permit us to believe that at a time not all Germans were mute and cowardly followers. Um, so I don't know if, if you want to agree or disagree with that. Is that one of the things that Sophie Scholl represents that not all Germans were mute and cowardly followers? Um, oh, I think and, so. um, Yeah, and also somebody just asked, were they beheaded? Yeah, it, it, oh, it, the film shows them as being beheaded. So just to confirm, is that how they were killed? Yes. Yeah, and Nathan, you were going to say something. No, I just wanted to follow up on the good points that uh, Frank was making. And uh, it's not just about character, but context, the context of German society. If we compare it with the film made in the early 80s by Michael Verhoeven called uh, The White Rose, he shows that the uh, society around uh, the Shoals was not just bystanders. There was an actual denunciation. They were they were uh, <clears throat> collaborators. Uh, people like the janitor, of course, uh, felt compelled uh, to act on behalf of the Gestapo. That shows the bottom up energy. Uh, characters, of course, are missing. But I think uh, you know scenes from that other film, for example, where you see uh, Sophie compromising by wearing a Nazi pin. Uh, in order to buy stamps is, is a critical uh, kind of insight. And uh, of course, uh, <clears throat> it's a, a very a different game when you uh, start the film at the point of their arrest. I'm gonna just pull another couple of questions here. Um, uh, were the capture and executions publicized to discourage other resistors or were they carried out secretly? The actual um, newspaper at the time, it's, it's actually, I've seen it, it's not very big. It's not actually a very big report, but it's quite small in that way. I think they, they made the show trial by, by um, having Roland Freisler, he was Hitler's hanging judge, by having him as the judge presiding over the trials, then obviously, you know, and that came right from Berlin, you know, that came right from the top of the Nazi regime. I think they wanted to make an example of them shortly after uh, Stalingrad. So that was the reason why he was wheeled in, because he was, a, you know, he's a big deal, uh, Roland Freisler. He was the judge 
at the Valkyrie, the 1944 trial. And he was known for humiliating defendants in that way. So I think the fact that they brought him down showed that they wanted to make an example of the White Rose. Maybe it was the timing, you know, in, in some ways it was the timing. They wanted to make an example of them. Um, would, would the same thing have happened in 1940 after the, after the victory over France? It was different circumstances. And, and people who were defined as, you know, um, I, I spoke to... I spoke to her sister when I was writing my book, Elizabeth, and she said that, you know, the families, I don't know whether um, Dr. Huber will, will confirm this, but they suffered as well, you know, from, from, the, from the local population as well. They, 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 the, the idea of uh, resisting the Nazi regime wasn't popular in Germany. And she said that, you know, she suffered a lot of ostracism even after the war. And, and Professor Huber, um, I want you to comment on that about how your family or your mom was uh, and was affected. Just before, there's a question if someone wants to just explain why it's called the White Rose, why they picked that name. Weshalb uh, White Rose einmal und dann, wie hat deine Familie das aufgenommen, damit umgegangen? Did you mean the name of the White Rose? But yeah, can you explain that as well as oh, to well, tell us about how your family was affected? There are many theories about the name of the White Rose. I personally prefer that is a literary allusion to a novel by Red Marwood called The White Rose. It's a novel written in Mexico and Red Marwood was a member of the Spartacus Aufstand in Munich, and he was a declared communist. He was sentenced to death and flew to Mexico and wrote there his novel, The White Rose. And I think it's an uh, allusion to this novel because it was forbidden anyway. And of course, forbidden literature is the best recommendation you could have for reading. And I think they could be sure that many people understood this allusion to this forbidden book. This is one point. Now, my family, I think, uh, I didn't quite understand the question. What, the, what was it about my family? About the I... neighbors, about how you're, if, oh, if yes. you're aware of how your neighbors responded, were they supportive of your family? Were they critical? Yeah, it was. <laughs> Yes, yes, it was difficult, of course. So if the friends of my mother said, well, if we should meet on the street, I go on the other side of the street, please, because this is necessary that we don't know each other. And this was not a single case. There were some other cases as well. So it was indeed very difficult. But the other point was there was no money at all. And uh, if my mother wouldn't have a very uh, great family, there were 11 uh, sisters, uh, 11 uh, brethren, and uh, they helped us a good deal, but otherwise it would have been very difficult, especially in the time, uh, in the last year of the war, and even in the time afterwards, it was a very difficult time. I was a bit uh, undernourished, and um, uh, this also is a sign that it was difficult for us just to survive. But the friends and the, the White Rose, I think even the best friends would not accept the White Rose as some people who, um, who had some sort of legitimate resistance to Hitler. I think they, most of them treated them as traitors. And even in the war afterwards, if you think, look at uh, female resistance. So there are famous names like Mildred Harnack or Libertas schulze boysen They were not so well known in Germany just because they were favored communism. And in the Cold War, you would have a, a, strict, a strict distinction between um, resistance that was okay and resistance that was communist. Even if it wasn't really communist, if it could be communist, that was enough 
to discredit it. And so uh, Mildred Harnack and Liberta schulze boysen didn't have that echo in the public opinion that they could have had. And, and how many brothers and sisters did you have? <laughs> Eleven. No. Oh, in your- oh, oh, in... I had only one sister, that was enough. So she just was... the two of you. And and did your did you and your sister and your children I don't know if, how many if you have children um, do they feel a special pride or burden at being the grandchildren or children of um, Professor Uber? Well, somehow I think we were pride, but we didn't talk about it, not even with each other. So um, it was some sort of taboo theme. I mean, if you live with a father that is executed, this is not the best thing to live in. And uh, you always you have the idea there was something wrong, but you don't know it exactly. And, um, so this was, um, for a long time, I couldn't talk about it at all. And that I tried to avoid it as possible. Uh, in school, of course, I didn't talk to anybody about my father. And I think everybody knew, but um, well, they didn't talk to me either. So I was happy. Well, today you should have tremendous pride. He is an incredible role model. And uh, it's very, very touching to have you involved with this panel and, and the remembering of resistance. And you bring up a fascinating question about other women resistors. And I know Nathan, you wanted to say a few words having studied the Baum group and the Rosenstrasse protest that there were in fact other women resistors. Um, can they be compared to Sophie Scholl? Or is, it, are the, is each act of resistance very unique? I think it is unique. And um, there, there were others. It depends what you wanna call resistance or opposition. Uh, many of the women, in fact, uh, that were protesting the crucifix decrees uh, in Bavaria in 1941 were, were women. Uh, Ian Kershaw called it a women's protest. Uh, that's often not considered uh, resistance, but uh, uh, the women had a special jurisdiction over family and, and religion. And uh, there was also that... Uh, protest in, uh, by women, 300, according to the secret police in Witten in the Ruhr area in October of 1943 for uh, uh, rations. And uh, uh, they might be uh, compared, but they're not really, really known. And besides, they shouldn't be compared because they were uh, really just uh, uh, compare, uh, opposing one issue, a single issue resistance that wasn't uh, opposing the regime as a whole, like uh, the White Rose. So, so that, for example, the Rosenstrasse was about saving their, their family members compared to this was more about toppling the regime. Well, um, I, I just wanted to fold in there. One of the questions is what role did the persecution of Jews play in the White Rose's motivation to join the resistance? It came up a little bit in the clip, but um, do one of you want to try to answer that? Was what? I, I think I think that um, it, it it wasn't a big factor, but of course in leaflet number two, they do actually highlight, and it's the only leaflet, the only resistance leaflet, that highlights the murder of the Jews that was going on in Poland. So you you know I think I think sort of. Uh, opposition to Nazism itself, to the idea of Nazism and all it stood for. And of course, the genocide flowing out from it and the fact, I mean, Sophie does mention in her interrogation how she had a Jewish friend and that Jewish friend was ostracized. So she was aware of the anti-Semitism. You could not be aware, unaware of the anti-Semitism in German society. And she was aware of it and it was part of the motivation to get rid of Nazism. You know, Nazism was also, she, 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 her mother, you know, knew about the euthanasia as well of, of children in, in, in hospitals. And, and, and that was a motivation as well. So there were many motivations. I think the, 
the, the main motivation was human rights and freedom, you know, that the Nazis were stopping people's human rights and freedom. And one of the rights of freedom is that, you know, um, we are all created equal. She would be in favour of that kind of idea. And of course, the Nazis were the opposite of that. We were not created equal. We were actually in, in a kind of pyramid with the master race at the top. And if you didn't fit in, you came at the bottom. And, you know, and at the bottom were the Jews, weren't they? And other sort of people they, they defined as, um, you know, untermenschen. So I think that, yeah, yes, it, it's in there. It's part of the kind of the mixture of the white rose, that they're against the idea of an unequal society, uh, that they mention the genocide. And that's clear, you know, at that time, you know, nobody was mentioning the genocide. So they, they mentioned the genocide and they thought it would be a stain on, on the German memory for, for all for all time. And in a way, you know, it, it is something that Germans have to, have to live with. They have to live with the past. The past, as somebody said, that will never pass away. Um, is there any way to measure, there's a few people who are saying like, what was their impact? Is there any way to measure um, both their actions and then the fact that the allied forces decided to copy that sixth leaflet and distribute tens of thousands of them across Germany. Can we say that that in and of itself is, a, is an impact, is a success? Do we know of any, uh, you had given one example, I guess, of, of somebody who emulated uh, Sophie Scholl. Is that, is that something you feel that we could say that they did have an impact in uh, promoting resistance during World War II or during against I the think, Holocaust? Yeah, I think if I put the historian's hat on, I'd, you'd have to say that, you know, the impact at the time that it existed was very, very limited. It didn't actually change much at the time they, they existed. What's important about the White Rose, and this is important about many things, many great movements don't have an impact at the time they exist, but some have a legacy. And it's the legacy of the White Rose that's important. It's that legacy of nonviolence. It's that legacy of human rights. It's that, it's that legacy of fighting against tyranny, standing up against tyranny. These are the legacies of the White Rose. And those legacies exist today. So what we admire about Sophie Scholl is not the fact that she failed in her life. It's that she was a massive success in her legacy, just as we see the same thing with Martin Luther King, you know, it's his dream that, that we tap into. And it's also Sophie's dream. And I think she says at one point, says to the, the, the woman who's, who's the guard in, in the prison before she's going to be executed, she has a little conversation with her. And she says, you know what? On the day of her execution, she says, you know, this morning, she said, I had a dream. And she said, then in the dream, I had a baby. And she said, um, and... I, I clasped hold of the baby and uh, I saved the baby, but I fell down the abyss, she said. She said, but the baby is our idea. It survived. Beautiful. Um, would anyone else like to make some closing statements as we end this conversation? Well, just to that last question, again, I would raise that uh, very effective remarks in the film uh, Downfall, they have that interview with Hitler's secretary and where she says straight out that, uh, you know, that, that hit her uh, so hard after many decades of giving herself a pass, she noticed that because she was young, she noticed that she was uh, in, uh, born in the same year as Sophie Scholl. And of course, uh, without the memorial, which, I, which didn't come for many decades until the 80s or 90s that she was talking about, uh, that wouldn't have happened. And Professor Huber, is there anything you would like to say before we? Well, if you think of the legacy of the White Rose, I should think um, what they wanted is a simple truth, not an alternative truth. So the simple truth <laughs> is enough. And I think we all should be keen to be ready to accept these simple truths, even if they are not very comfortable. So, for instance, to accept the Holocaust is not a comfortable thing for the Germans, but it's the truth and they have to accept it. And this is the simple truth. No alternative truth could help in that case.
Thank you so much. Um, it, it has been so inspiring to reflect on how Sophie Scholl, you know, raised her voice, how she expressed empathy, how all the members of the White Rose, you know, fought against apathy, um, fought against apathy with poetry, with humor, with commitments, um, you know, with hard work. And it, it is terribly inspiring. And we, we, we do hope that in our generation and in the next generation, there are others who are inspired by their example and do not applaud those who put down dissent, but actually lift it up. So this is, this is the lesson of this panel on February 22nd on the anniversary of their execution and, and also in thinking about July 13th, the anniversary of your father's execution. And um, they should not die in vain. Their idea, their baby, their, you know, that image of that dream should live on um, through us. And, and I thank the Museum of Jewish Heritage for allowing us to share that. Um, and there's books, there's films, um, there's a museum exhibit at the Wagner College Holocaust Center on Rescue and Resistance that includes, it's behind me, that includes Sophie Scholl's story. And of course, there's the memorial in Munich. And uh, please continue to discuss their, their story. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Thank I would you. just like to echo what Lori said. Thank you to all of our panelists and to Lori for moderating today. Um, this has been so great. I, I personally learned so much. Um, and thank you to all of you out there who are watching. Um, everything we do at the museum is made possible through donor support. Um, so we hope you'll consider making a donation to support the museum or becoming a member or joining us for our upcoming programs, which you can check out at the link in the Zoom chat. Um, so thank you all so much again. And uh, thank a special thank you again to our panelists and our moderator.